Um, I'm not guided this morning to talk about leadership. Uh, that wasn't where the Spirit took me as I prepared. And uh, in fact, you know, the trajectory of my life has not primarily been aimed to be someone who helps leaders. That's what happened. That's what I do. But um, I've been very moved over the years by the journey into calling which each of us share. Uh, we are called by God for a unique purpose. We have God's calling upon us. We are eternally living, never dying beings whom God is lifting up uh, into eternal purpose with him. Um, I brought a little tiny, tiny book with me uh, in which I reflect on how, grow, how God grows us up into our eternal purpose and um, they're in the back of the room so uh, that's just a gift as as you leave um, uh, in which I unpack uh, through some stories that I tell more about that. What I was guided a little book called With and it's a story about uh, God's business uh, the enterprise of God in creating forming um, beings men and women and then growing them up and then uh, doing that with purpose and, um, you know, and, uh, and his own pleasure in mind so that we can serve with him forever. I've been guided to a, a bit of a different uh, focus today on calling. Um, uh, as I watch the events of the world, I am, I am aware of the, uh, the ways in which the enemy deceives and undermines and seeks to ruin uh, value, uh, seeks to ruin lives, seeks to divide people, uh, seeks to uh, distort. It says at the end of the book of Revelation that one of the things that's going to happen is that Satan will be bound and thrown into a deep abyss where he can no longer deceive the nations. And praise the Lord for that, and it can't come too soon because, in fact, deception uh, is afoot everywhere. And given what I'm watching, uh, I've made a commitment that when I have opportunities to preach, um, and I do from time to time, I'm an ordained pastor in the Conservative Mennonite Conference. I'm a Lancaster boy, went to Eastern Mennonite University, um, graduated from that a long time ago, and bit by bit um, have found my way back to um, my grandparents' roots with Conservative Mennonite Conference, where Melanica and I are delighted uh, to belong. Uh, as I get opportunities to preach, I, I, I stick to fundamentals because we need the encouragement of truth. Uh, John 8, 32, uh, our Lord said, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. It is the liar who binds us. I love the songs we sang this morning with respect to this. And I want to talk about calling, um, and I want to do, usually I work with men and women who, who own enterprises and are trying to figure out, you know, the next step they're going to take. I want to pull it all the way back to the regular daily challenge of understanding calling and identity for every believer, which is the foundation of anything uh, that matters. I'm going to read two passages, one for truth and then one for navigation on the basis of that truth. And let me start with the Ephesians text. I'm going to read um, 10 verses. We can stand that, right? And uh, starting at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, uh, by the way, Paul is quite clear, so we don't have to guess what he's saying here. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Uh, I could simply read, you know, as for you, you and I, because we're talking about us here. Um, I won't ask for a raise of hands how many have been spoken to just now. You were dead in your transgressions. That's all of us, just to be clear. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. 
But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Lost my place. Good place to lose it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now start to pay attention, please, to this word work. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are his, God's, handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Just a quick review. Verse 3, we were deserving of wrath nature. Uh, any teaching that is afoot that, that would suggest that the human person is wonderful just as they are and ought to be left alone is rooted in deception. We are deserving of wrath by nature. Verse 5, by grace you have been saved. Any teaching that suggests that we come to wholeness and healing through any other path then the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is deception. In fact, I have come to find that um, true healing for people in every kind of brokenness follows no other path than that. Verse 9, it's not by works. You know, this is wonderful. Our salvation is... By our works. He flips it. You see, we're his work. We're his work. He's, he's doing the work. We're the work. We're the project. Created, and this is so wonderful, makes your head spin, to do good works, which he laid out for us. It says he prepared in advance for us to do. I'm going to work on this a little bit in the second section. I have an objective here, which is uh, to help us know upon which, we, that, upon which what we stand. We stand on the grace of our Lord. There is no other foundation. Menno was correct, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which was laid in Jesus Christ. We stand on the grace of God. We're saved by grace, by nothing else. And we're saved by a God who is doing more than saving us. He's doing a work. He's building something in us. He has purpose in us beyond saving us from ourselves. He's saving us from our sin, and he's saving us for purpose. We're talking about calling this morning. Uh, we're his work. We're, we're a piece of work, you could say, God's. And he's got good work for us to do uh, so that we don't lose our way then. The good work we're going to do doesn't save us. It is an expression of our salvation in him. It's like the good work he has called us to do expresses the God who is now within us, who has saved us so that we can um, serve him. And he had all of this laid out ahead of time. One of my objectives this morning, one of my goals is to reduce the anxiety we have about the worthiness of our life or the need to figure out what it is like we could ourselves figure out what it is that we're on earth to do. He prepared it for us. He took care of the whole thing from the beginning, through the middle, all the way to the end. Amen? Amen. And so uh, that's the Ephesians text. And um, in order to rest on that, that's the truth text, uh, I want to tell you a story from the book of Matthew. Um, I'm not going to read through it, but uh, in Matthew chapter 11, it's in your bulletin, uh, first um, 11 verses, something very interesting happens. In all of my years, I've never heard it explained 
Um, we kind of skirt around it. John the Baptist is in prison, and Jesus isn't behaving right, according to what they thought the Messiah was going to do. They thought the Messiah was going to come in on horseback. They thought the Messiah was going to re-seize the, the throne of David, re-establish the kingdom, kick out the Romans, and it's going to be awesome. And so John has bet his life literally on, on Jesus Christ. Um, his whole life as, as forerunner was in order to pave the way. John was completely submitted to this. John was a beautiful man. And he's in prison now, and he's seeing things that aren't on the script. It, Jesus is, is he's, he's traipsing into neighborhoods he doesn't belong. He's talking to people that aren't clean. Uh, he's fraternizing and fellowshipping with people who are enemies. And John is nervous, and, he, and Jesus doesn't own any horses. And so he sends his disciples to Jesus, and you know this text. They come to Jesus, and they say, uh, Jesus, you know, John wants to know, are you the one, or should we be looking for someone else? You remember this? Are you him, or should we be looking for someone else? And it has got to be one of the most painful texts in the New Testament when you think about this beautiful, faithful man, John the Baptist, in prison. He's about to lose his head. And he is afraid he was wrong about everything. And then Jesus says, well, tell John this. He says, tell John the blind are seeing. Tell him the, um, the lame are walking. Tell him the lepers are being cleansed. Tell John the deaf are hearing. Tell him the dead are being raised. And tell him that the poor are hearing good news. Go tell him that and tell him not to take offense. I want to sit on that for a quick second. I don't know another place in the Gospels where someone asked Jesus a question and Jesus told them exactly what they were hoping to hear. I do not know another place. I don't know another place where someone said, hey, Jesus has got a question. Jesus answered it and the guy said, that's just pretty much what I was hoping you would say. I don't know that text here. Jesus gives John exactly what John is hoping to hear. He's quoting the texts of Scripture that John has eaten his whole life. He is sending back to John a word of comfort in language John will get. Jesus could have said, well, tell John, he doesn't understand a couple of things. And by the way, John didn't understand a couple of things. Jesus could have done that. But Jesus knows what's going on. He knows his friend, his faithful friend is going to die. And he knows he's a good and faithful man. And he sends back a word of comfort. He gives him just what John wanted. And the disciples leave and take the word back. And we don't... We don't know that part of the story, but I have to believe John was mightily comforted by this word. And that John said, all right, that's, that's what I expected from the Messiah. And that John died knowing that he had not made a mistake. I have to believe that. I have to believe that. But here's what happens. After the disciples leave, Jesus has something else to say to his own disciples. He said, you know, that man John was the greatest one there ever was. Up until now, no man, no one born of woman, which I think that's comprehensive, was greater than John. But the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Jesus didn't send that word back to John because John didn't need to hear that and wouldn't have grasped it. 
Jesus gave John his compassion and his comfort. And I want to take a look at that. Um, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven, I, I don't know you, but I have an imagination, being a human being myself, that you have low times. I can imagine, for example, that uh, sometimes you think you're not living up to what you ought to be living up to, or perhaps you're not as good as some other believers, or, or perhaps what you struggle with is uh, worse than what other people struggle with, or perhaps you're not showing up in your life the way the Lord wants you to show up. I can imagine things like that. So would you, if you're one of the people I've just described, Melanic is one of them, I'm one of them, if, if you're in that camp of knowing uh, disappointment in yourself or wondering about uh, how well you've done, would you just for the next couple of minutes allow yourself to be granted the status of least in the kingdom of heaven? Would you do that for me? Just, just, just put yourself there so that everything else I have to say is, is relevant. Um, let's be at the bottom of the barrel here in the kingdom together for just a minute. Remember, we're saved by grace not by works so you are in if you gave your heart to jesus christ and you said i can't do this without you i'm a sinner please receive me he did on the basis of who he is he did that therefore you're in the kingdom by grace not by your works so let's uh, let's at least um, place ourselves at the position at least greater than John, by the way. That ought to feel pretty good. Quite unbelievable, isn't it? But still, he said, he said it. I didn't say it. Bottom of the barrel, scraping the bottom of the barrel, least of the kingdom. That's, we'll be the fellowship of the least this morning for a couple of minutes. What was Jesus saying? He was saying that everything changed from the beginning of time to John. And from that moment of the kingdom forward, everything changed. And I'm, I'm just going to short circuit it. I'm going to make it quick and easy. In simple terms, in the light of Jesus Christ and his salvation, we now have Christ in us. No more of the performing no more of the obeying uh, in order to be acceptable. No more of the going back to make another sacrifice. No more of the keeping score of have I, have I done enough to get the sins forgiven that I am not damned. No more of that. It's a new day in Jesus Christ where he is the, the sufficiency I seek and he resides here. I didn't bring you all the texts, but let me just read you a couple of them. Paul, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Don't you realize Jesus Christ is in you? He's in you. Romans 8, 10. Christ is in you. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is not of us, but of him. Let's locate ourselves. We're the least at the bottom of the barrel. We're the jars of clay in that sentence. We have this treasure in jars of clay. Galatians 2.20, it is Christ who lives in me. Colossians 1.27, Paul's talking about the mystery, the mystery now, in light of his arrival and his introduction of the kingdom and his death and resurrection and the grace that now restores us, redeems us from our sin. He says, the great mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, what does this mean for us in terms of our calling? Uh, what it means is that the ancient dualism is fractured. Christ is here. He is resident within you on your worst day, worst night. He's present. And he's working out his purposes to his glory and to his pleasure. The devil wants to tell us the other story. You're no good. You're not worthy. Nobody likes you. 
you don't measure up. You know, you really blew it. God had more for you and you let him down. The devil is saying this to us all the time. By the way, he tried it with Jesus too in the wilderness. The devil is a liar. Um, uh, Melanica had read the scripture to me the other day. He's been a murderer from the beginning. There is no truth in him. The truth is you are saved by grace, lest you boast. And the truth is, from the standpoint of calling, he takes care of it. If I had time, I would ask each of you to share one person that you believe is really living out their faith in a way that's fantastic, as compared to you, understand. Bottom of the barrel, we're the fellowship at the bottom of the barrel, okay, just for today, at least in the kingdom. And I would hear wonderful names. I would hear Billy Graham, and I would hear, you know, I, I, I might hear Dave's dad. I don't know. I, I, I would hear names, wouldn't I? Harold, uh, people who are really doing it. And you would have, you would admire them for their faith and for their love and various things. Um, let me give you one. I've been a big admirer um, uh, through the years of what happened in South Africa. One of the only times in history when an oppressed people, now it's gone downhill, but at the beginning, an oppressed people threw off the shackles of their oppression and became the leaders and didn't create a bloodbath across the nation. Usually, revolutionaries just want their turn being oppressors. And um, Nelson Mandela came out of prison and um, he put together, along with Bishop Desmond Tutu, a, a ministry of reconciliation to allow for healing. And it, it, in history, it was a remarkable thing. Okay, Nelson Mandela. Uh, you may not know he was a believer. Nelson Mandela, not a bad guy, right? He did something worthwhile compared to the rest of us. You and me. Oh, wait a second. How did he come to Christ? Uh, do you know that story? Do you know, do you know about the, um, the young man who introduced the true Jesus to Nelson while he was in prison? Do you know about him? No. Yeah, you don't know about him. Um, you know about Nelson. You don't know about the boy. Young man, he was the son of the warden. Son of the Warden, a white young man, Bible studies with Nelson Mandela, and led him to Jesus Christ, introduced him to forgiveness, introduced him to the themes of Scripture where, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Antidote to cancel culture there. South Africa did not carry out cancel culture. And, um, and so you didn't know about him. So there was a young man who went faithfully to the prison to do Bible study. He had a pretty good calling, didn't he? But wait a minute. How do you get a young man like that? Nelson Mandela was an astute judge of character, a perceptive and astute man. I had the, the pleasure, the privilege of spending a couple of hours in a room with him. Black South African leader of the revolution sitting at the feet of a young white guy whose dad is the warden. Why would Nelson Mandela even sit there? Except that he saw a good boy. He knew a good heart. And he made the decision that outward appearances, outward appearances notwithstanding, part of the oppressor class, young, white. This was, this was an honorable young man, and he submitted to teaching. How do you get a boy like that? I suggest to you he had a very good mother. I don't know how you get a, a boy like that who is a boy of that character without a really good mother and father. And so when she was washing his diapers? Was she thinking, awesome calling I have? 
Or was she thinking she had fallen short of the grander contributions others were making to the kingdom? The good works that he has called us to, he has shaped for us from the beginning of time. What's your day going to be like tomorrow? You know, God arranged for that. Sam says, I don't know. Maybe you'll make some pies. God is arranging the circumstances of our life so that we can be present in them and Christ can be present in us. We need a truly gospel understanding of who we are. Now that we are in a new era in which even those who are least in the kingdom are greater than John. Many nights, uh, every night, Melanica and I pray together and it goes something like, um, thank you, God, for this day and we're going to give this all back to you now and, and now we're going to sleep. I thank you that you're staying awake. There's many nights that I have no idea what the day was worth. So friends, I, uh, I invite you from these texts to give up the job of being the Lord of the judgment of the worth of your day. You are not the the judger. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Here's a good definition of your ministry. Who you are, as you are, where you are. Yielded to him. And you say, well, I, I don't like the circumstances of any of this. I didn't say you did. <laughs> Who you are, as you are, yeah, but I, I need to lose 10 pounds. Fair enough, me too, 20. Who you are, as you are, where you are, yielded to him, is your ministry. Yeah, but I, I feel like God wants me to do something else. Well, he's sovereign. And if you're to do something else, you'll get there. You, you think God loses track of us? Like, oh boy, how do you get over there? God is sovereign. God has you where you are. The ordinary circumstances of your day please him for his purpose. Many of us say, you know, Lord, I, I want you to get me out of this circumstance. And often the Lord says, well, if I get you out of it, who will I, ha who will I have in it? I have you in it so that I can be in it because I am resident with you. Underneath all the language of calling, friends, is a caller. Our calling is not some arduous exercise we have to undergo to figure it out like we could in the first place. There's a caller, the Lord. He has placed himself within us. Uh, the circumstances of our day are kingdom circumstances. The locations that we find ourselves in are missional locations. Jesus would like to be fully deployed through you where you are. Many times, at the end of the day, we don't know what he did. Really, I think our chief problem as believers is that we would like to know what he did. Actually, I think it would probably be bad for us if we knew everything he did through us. You know, do you ever have someone say, remember that time you said, and it's like Harold, like, remember that time you came and talked? To, I, I don't remember it either. And it just picked me up so much, and, and we don't remember that event, but it happened. We do not need to know the value of our life to him, because he has established it. We're on a need-to-know basis. And so my, uh, my uh, encouragement to you is keep it very clear, outside of Christ, we are deserving of wrath by nature. Let's not get on our high horses here. It is by grace that you have been saved. Not by works, lest anyone boast. We are God's handiwork, created to do good works, oftentimes in the middle of a quite ordinary day with trouble. Created to do good works, which he established for us from the beginning to do. And I... I charge you to go out into your day as you are, yielded. Lord, such as I am, use me. And glory to the Lord. May I say a prayer? Is that legal here in the church? Can, can, I, can, can I pray for the congregation?
Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for um, your grace, which makes everything possible and without which nothing is possible. And uh, as we walk through troubled times, bring us back to the truth that we are part of an eternal kingdom and that you are at work. All the places that were mentioned this morning that were prayed for, Lord, we do pray for them. Uh, Afghanistan, we add... Uh, yeah, we had um, so many countries that we think of where there is trouble. But we know that you are resident in every one of these places, resident within the lives of believers. We know that your church is growing. We know that witness is being shared. Uh, we know that uh, in the midst of the daily travails of our life and its suffering and its doldrums even, yes, Father, that you're working out your glorious purposes. Thank you that you saw fit to create us, to grow us up, to make it possible for us to be saved and to place our feet onto pathways where we may walk and work and serve and be instruments, vessels of your very self. We ask that you would take glory from all of this eternally. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.